Just like slacking, which I've done a video and a stream on, Reggie Gigas is also infamously known for an awful ability that makes it all but useless. But within the confines of Generation 1, where there are no abilities, how will the colossal Pokemon perform in a Pokemon Red solo challenge? Now, if you need some details on the rules for the run, check out the description, but do grab yourself a Sodi Pop. I think it's time we just get to it. The stats, they're top tier. No surprise, we got that nasty 160 base attack. That's pretty much the standout here. But when your lowest stat is 100, I think we all know that you're in for a good time. For the moves, I went with Generation 6. That's what inspired this set here. I did go with Crush Grip because a run with a Pokemon without a signature move just feels kind of silly. But since it only has 5 PP, I did go with Dizzy Punch to help round things out. I will be using Thunder Punch and Ice Punch as well. The level 1 moves that you're seeing here, they're generally, they just use the bottom 4 and the rest require a move relearner. But for the purposes of these cross gen runs, I do just pick and choose. I didn't recreate any of the other level up moves because they just aren't useful or they will be learned at the level that we would have already beat the game at. I will go over Crush Grip and I'll give you some thoughts on it soon and what I decided to go with, but let's just kind of get to the run. It's going to be the absolute bare minimum today, and after taking out that very first mandatory bug catcher, it's straight to Brock. The great thing about Regigigas compared to other high attack Pokemon like Tyranitar is that Ice Punch combined with 110 base special, it does allow us not to do any extra battles and still be pretty comfortable here. Generally the drawback of having a top tier attack stat means that Brock isn't efficient at level 6, but here it's a simple matter, two Ice Punches to each of the rocks and just like that, Regigigas has obtained the first badge. Now let's just go back to Crush Grip. The actual Crush Grip has a varying power. It depends on the HP of your opponent. It has 120 base power if they are at full health, and it goes all the way down to just one base power if they are at 1% health. Now if you look to the right, you'll see that I just went with a standard 100 base power normal move. And this is only the second time that I've ever used my executive power to change a move to make it more in line with my vision. And if you're wondering, the other one is Reggie Alecki's Thunder Cage. It didn't really fit well into Gen 1 either. Now outside of just being kind of lazy and not wanting to add a bunch of code, I went with 100 base power for a couple of reasons. Number one, I wanted it to be stronger than Body Slam to give me an actual like interesting choice in the mid game. And since Body Slam also has that one out of three paralysis chance, I knew it had to be tempting to give me an actual choice between the two moves later in the game. Since the move only has five PP, anything less than 100 is sort of felt bad and not really indicative of a legendary signature move. I did talk about this with some of you on a stream a while ago, but a standard 100 base power move with 5 PP is what I landed on, but if you have some thoughts, by all means leave a comment. As for Route 3 and Mount Moon, there's actually no extra battles today. There's no need to go into the dirty details, but PP management between Crush Grip and Dizzy Punch to allow me to not have to heal any from the start of the game, it did go a long way. And once I get to Cerulean, the disadvantage for a slow leveling group Pokemon doing the bare minimum like we just seen, it means that I'm only level 13, but despite barely being higher level than Brock's Onyx, Regigigas, he's heading straight into Misty with no fear. The solution to this underleveled puzzle is simple. Just use Crush Grip. Now you would think that Thunder Punch would be the way, but it's just kind of too weak to be reliable at a lowly level 13. And don't forget to let it sink in that Regigigas has 160 base attack. This move hits like a truck, but Starmie still isn't gonna be clean. There's only around a 45% chance to get the two shot. And even though I crit turn one, you can see that that double bubble beam, it puts tears in the Reggie's eye, but I do survive with six HP. And this was a huge enabler for the run. Hopping directly into rival number two and we can see it pay dividends immediately. Jumping up to level 15 to that next damage rounding threshold was huge and it really justifies doing the minimum battle strategy earlier because I can just cleanly one shot the usually problematic sand attacking bird and things look great. But like I said that really fast. Dizzy punch for the next couple, they can just take them out and then I can use crush grip once again to close. I can make this one clean and that's going to be a swift end to what it could have been a potentially slow part of the game without some solid planning so I was really happy with this result. Now it's time for Nugget Bridge. 
we got power we got coverage it's not really worth talking about there's a lot of trainers here i think you already know that but i will talk about crush grip and the restrictions of 5pp now the overall challenge for this run was sort of determining when you absolutely needed to use it maybe to get a range here or just to save you a couple of turns here and there while not having to overheal or overly rely on it. I already had to heal a couple of times, but I guess just to kind of lay it down, lay down the formula for this run, you just need to know that it was very important to manage the PP of Crush Grip. Have I said that enough already? Are we on the same page? Now we can just take it all the way down to the SSN, and we talked about the mid-game choice, Body Slam, Crush Grip, which one are you going to pick? And my friends, I ask you the question, why not both? That's what we're going to do for the majority of this run, at least for a little bit, is we're just going to use both. Body Slam, really good, I don't need to tell you that. Crush Grip's really good situationally, but Body Slam's just good over reliable, we're going to use both. And I am going to do the Gentleman Candy here. You see that on very, very top tier runs that you would skip stuff like this, but I find that more often than not, whether it be Shadow Lugia, whether it be Slacking, whether it be Mewtwo, a lot of Pokemon just need the extra levels if they're in the slow leveling group. It really is a huge detriment. It's hard to understate that. And you'll see me do this a couple of times because the candies are just so important. You can skip them on a run like Alola Ninetales. They're in a faster leveling group. They get levels a little bit quicker and they don't have to worry about being so far behind. But I don't want to keep going on about that. It's important to touch on. And when we get to rival number three, we can also just kind of skip to the end of this. Uh, we're just going to throw up War Turtle, Crush Grip. All you need to know, he's down. And let's skip it over to Surge. And I can make this one very, very, very simple as well. I just use Crush Grip. We saved, we routed in a way where we would save three Crush Grips. So I can just hold down A, smile at my screen, drink a sip of my Sodi Pop while Surge just goes down. And while this battle is kind of just playing out here, something I haven't brought up yet. If you're new to these cross-gen type runs, Runs, you will know that we chase Mewtwo. The whole point of these runs is to see if we can beat Mewtwo's time. Now, so far, we've done about a dozen and a half of these. Why I don't just say the exact number, I don't know. It's probably because I don't know. But to date, only four Pokemon have ever been able to pass the Mewtwo bar. It's a pretty high bar. So today, when we're looking at the split data, which we'll finally show now, through three gyms here at the Lieutenant Surge split, Regigigas holds a 17 second lead over the Mewtwo pace. No reason to really go too far into it just this early into the video. I will bring this up probably after Giovanni talk about it again. But just like most runs, they will do things in a slightly different order. And if you're wondering about that Misty split where I'm eight minutes ahead, it's because Mewtwo found it a little bit better just to go ahead and take on Nugget Bridge then come back to Misty. So that's why there's kind of a disparity there. But Regigigas is on pace, looking good. And as far as Rock Tunnel and all that kind of stuff goes, nothing interesting. I think we can just take it straight into Celadon. Next up is the Rocket Hideout, and I'm gonna be skipping all the high money items. I do that very often on high tier runs. The only thing I'm gonna get is a rare candy, and we don't really have to go into this, but instead I'd like to just quickly just touch on something I talk about quite often, I feel like. I don't wanna be a broken record, but it's just vitamins in general. They're just, they're not that effective, and they just waste a lot of time to pick up a lot of overworld items for no reason. Like I've said before, if you're just scrounging every little overworld item just to get the most money, just so you can buy, I don't know, five proteins on Reggie Gigas here, like what does it really do for you? It doesn't do much and it just ends up bloating your time by a minute or two, which is pretty significant when you're trying to really beat fast times. And I bring up all this stuff just to say, I know some of you probably play along or you see bigger channels do this kind of stuff and you wanna kinda emulate that, you wanna kinda do your own runs. And if I can just give anybody any kinda tips to make their runs better, or if anybody ever came into the comments and said something like, hey, I was doing some runs and your tips really helped me out, they saved me a few minutes and I was able to get a time I was really happy with, I think that'd be pretty cool. Next up is the Celadon Mark Bot, and I'd like to draw a spotlight on something I never talk about, and it's repels and item efficiency. Now, I always buy one extra repel in Vermilion. Why do I do that? I set my inventory up in such a way where I always know where stuff is at and I can always go through it and by the time we get to the final optimized run, inventory management is a non-issue. I keep the repel in the second slot, I buy the super repels, and then from the cell menu right here, I'll go down to the bottom, 
I'll take the super repels, I'll replace them with the repels, and I'll sell that repel, and it makes it very quick and very efficient. Now, if you didn't know, or maybe if you underestimated it, menuing in this game is the single biggest time loss across all runs. You might not think you're being really slow in the menu, but it is costing you significant time, and just thinking about that kind of stuff goes a long way. I'd say probably the single biggest thing to save time is to have efficient item management. Now, we do also have to talk about the top floor TMs. I'm actually going to buy two today. Now, Rock Slide we'll talk about soon. It's kind of like an obvious thing to grab anyway, a high physical attack. It's important, but Ice Beam. Ice Beam something I normally don't get. I've talked about this a lot. I think Blizzard's a better move, and I think if you can kind of route out ways just to get Blizzard and not have to use Ice Beam, you'll be better for it. But Regigigas is this like specific case where Blizzard doesn't do much for me. Normally, it would let Blizzard would let you hit ranges on something like Executor or maybe like Agatha's Golbat, but that's not the case today, and we will be using Ice Beam eventually. So that's like a little wrinkle that I normally don't do. But that's pretty much it. No vitamins, very quick overall buy. And I think we can just skip over to Pokemon Tower. And I'm going to skip over rival number four. I'm going to cut straight to the channelers to talk about Rock Slide for a minute. And there's some obvious uses for this move. The coverage is going to be good. But what it does specifically for this run is it allows me to one-shot the Gastlys and save a little bit of time. Because without it, I'd have to go for like Ice Punch. It would be a two-shot and it opens me up for some bad luck. Now, you're going to see I'm going to get bad luck anyway. I'm going to miss some Rock Slides. I'm going to get confused. And it's not going to matter much, but I do waste a little bit of time. But it was very interesting to me to see that Rock Slide's main use in the run here was just to make Pokemon Tower a little bit faster. And I think that's more important to talk about than me just completely steamrolling over rival number four. Erica's up next, and before I was doing these optimized runs, I wasn't picking up Rock Slide and I wasn't using it immediately. I was trying to do Erica real quick, and doing this at an earlier level means that Crush Grip or Ice Punch or something like that, they don't have one shot ranges, which means you're opened up to like sleep luck and you can just waste a lot of time. So it felt really good to go ahead and pick up Rock Slide, make Pokemon Tower as fast as possible, and then when we return to Erica here, Crush Grip is just clean one shots, makes this one very quick. Not much more to really say. Next up, we're going to Silphco, and just to kind of summarize this real quick, I will be going to the 10th floor. It's pretty important for Regigigas. Like I've already mentioned with the Gentleman Candy, the extra rare candies on a slow leveling group Pokemon are always pretty helpful. But more importantly, Earthquake is up here, and we need Earthquake, and we're going to replace Body Slam with it. Body Slam's been really good in this mid-game just to keep us trucking along without slowing down. But we're kind of at the point in the game where I can just manage Crush Grip really efficiently. And I guess I haven't talked about it yet, but when you have a move that only has five power points it feels like it's something that's like second nature hey grab the pp ups but just like with uh, overworld items or buying vitamins it's just a slowdown you can save more time if you just learn how to micromanage the pp of crush grip but that's neither here nor there let's not go into it too much and you might wonder hey why aren't you just going down to fuchsia first usually i go down to the safari zone and i think i mentioned this with metagross in the last versus video but notice that i'm only level 33 there are some like higher level Pokemon in Safari Zone and you open yourself up to wild encounters. It's a pretty low chance to get them, but if you can just avoid it, Safari Zone doesn't really do anything for me anyway. So avoiding all encounters, just going ahead, getting through Sylph, it went a long way. Now, also, I know I'm talking about a lot of stuff here. I was using rare candies in pretty much all of my runs until the last couple of optimizations, and I, I went without it. And I guess the long and short of it is that I needed extra levels at the end of the game, so holding off on candies now and just kind of toughing it out and during these parts of the game, it really paid a lot of dividends. We'll see that later. But with all of that said, I do the bare minimum here outside of the 10th floor, and we can just go straight into rival number five. So there's no need so far to really break down fights too much. Regigigas is strong, Regigigas crush grips anything, they go down for the count. You kind of know how it goes. But the only difference here, let's say I was using candies to get up to level 38, the only thing that that does for you is it makes some stuff a little bit quicker later, and it gives you more one-shot ranges here. Now, without the candies only being level 33, it might seem like a pretty big challenge, but it's not. Overall, the only thing that it changes is it makes Pidgeot a two-shot, 
and it makes Blastoise a two shot. Everything else I can just mow down in one hit. And when I started to look at the damage ranges and stuff like that, I realized I could just cut out the candies and it would still be a pretty quick fight regardless. But any Pokemon that can just come straight to rival number five, under leveled, not use candies and just get through it really easy, I think it's safe to say it's a pretty good Pokemon. And as they say, when in Rome, when I'm already in Saffron, I love to just go ahead and take on Sabrina if possible. And you're gonna see that I'm not scared of her at all. I don't heal going into this fight. It does look kind of dangerous, missing like 40% of your health, but it's a pretty simple matter of one shots. And the only risk in this fight is that you don't outspeed Alakazam. It's gonna get a hit. Now, if it crits, so be it. I was willing just to go ahead and do another run if I had to, but here you can see that it doesn't hit that hard if it doesn't crit. We get the one shot and that's another badge down. After that, I do some busy work. We finally tackle the Safari Zone. Nothing interesting there, bare minimum. And we're going straight into Koga. Now here, you're gonna see me use Crush Grip on the Coughings because it's a one-shot range, and I use Earthquake for everything else. Now, why am I doing this? It's because I don't wanna to have to heal anymore until I'm fighting the last gym, so I'm trying to preserve Earthquakes, looking ahead to Blaine. Now, I guess you know the fight's pretty easy when you have Earthquake, Poison Tops are weak to ground, go figure. And like always, I don't, I can not really think of a Pokemon, maybe something that resists normal moves could survive like a critical hit self-destruct but we don't have to worry about it and let me just say that i love that reggie gigas doesn't really even have to go into detail about these fights i could probably just go into any fight and just say crush grip earthquake and we'd just be done with it but that's gonna take us to a brisk swim down to cinnabar everybody's favorite part of the week remember that i'm not picking up blizzard today i already have ice beam and we'll talk about the learn set soon because it's kind of weird notice that i'm pretty much kind of stuck with some standard stuff i have some tms i haven't learned yet i still have thunderbolt i still have ice beam when are they going to come into play all will be answered soon enough my child and after answering the, the age-old brain tickler of if tm28 is actually tombstoner brother or not let's just jump into blaine now I mentioned earlier on Koga that we were just preserving some earthquakes here just so we can kind of zoom through and not have to heal anymore. And you know, you already know. We can crush grip some of the weaker Pokemon and then when we need Earthquake, we can just start to spam it out. And there's really not much risk here. We outspeed everything. Now Arcanine's the thick puppy. He can survive. And you're gonna notice that not even the Fire Blast really hurts that much, but that's pretty clean and that's seven badges down. I think we can just hop straight into that final gym. And surprise, surprise, everybody. There's not much more to say here. It's going to be a pretty easy battle. What I will talk about is Ice Punch still being on the learn set. Why not just learn Ice Beam? And I just tell you to hold your horses and just let me explain or just watch the rest of the video. But Ice Punch, it just gives you that little bit of coverage here. Now, most Pokemon don't have 160 base attack. Earthquake still does really well here, and you're going to see me use it later in the fight. But just on little things like Rhyhorn or Rhydon that have really high defense, it's just good to have. Now granted, it's it's not that much of a difference between that and Earthquake considering our very stupidly high attack, but you can kind of see the decision to not use rare candies earlier didn't really matter that much because I still steamrolled. Yes, I was normally a lot higher level here in early iterations of the routing, but I think the cleanness of how I went through the game kind of shows you that it really wasn't needed. Now, speaking of rare candies, right after the fight, it's time to go ahead and blow all 10 of those bad boys. This is going to get me up to level 52, and this is precisely what I needed. I wanted to be around level 53 going into the Elite Four to make it a little bit faster, and it's just what I found gave the best results. Now, if you're using early candies, you might be around level 50 here, and it just felt a little bit slow in those final battles of the game, and I thought this was a good balance. I do make a little tiny mistake here. I'm supposed to learn Thunderbolt after rival number six, but I go ahead and I learn it here. I learn it over Ice Punch. It doesn't really matter. We just talked about Ice Punch just a little bit, and I was saving it for something like Rhyhorn or something like that, just in case Earthquake couldn't get the one shot. It has a better one shot range than Earthquake does, and that's pretty much the only significance. Very teeny tiny mistake. I don't know why I did it, but I did, but it didn't really cost us. And before I start to babble on, before I start sounding like Scott Steiner math, why don't we just hop straight into rival number six? And this is where the candies really pay off. We went as far as we could in the game without needing that little extra boost. And if you tried to do this fight at lower level, and trust me, I tried this fight at low level before, it just didn't feel that great. It felt a little bit slow and you could actually lose the fight. Now what 52 does is pretty straightforward. It gives us damage ranges. And you're gonna see me just one shot everything. That feels really great. 
And to me personally, this felt like the optimal time to use your candies. There's kind of an ebb and flow and there's some people out there that think you should save your candies to like the very, very end. Like I'm not gonna use my candies to the champion fight. I think that's really stupid, but sometimes it can be just as stupid to use your candies early, but it really depends on the run. But here was the point to where it made this fight feel really clean and it really sets us up going really strong into the Elite Four. But first, let's kind of get everybody caught up and see what we're looking like before we get to that point. First up, let's take a look at split data. It's been a minute, but like I said on the Polytoad video, I would like to start just kind of looking at this around the third gym and then sort of at the end. I think it gives us little data nerds enough information to kind of see where things are at and it doesn't bloat the video for people who just don't care. But I digress. After Giovanni and before we get to the Elite Four, we're going to show the Elite Four start here. We are two minutes and 19 seconds ahead of Mewtwo pace, which feels pretty comfortable overall to me. Now, two minutes isn't nothing. I just used the double negative there. What are you going to do about it? And just once again, I'll probably stop talking about this soon, but you can see the middle splits why I don't really show them that often. Look how wonky they are because we go through different orders and different ways to go through the game. And you can see that some splits like Sabrina, hey, I'm 17 minutes ahead of Mewtwo. But when you get to Blaine, I'm only 34, I'm 34 seconds behind. So it looks a little weird, but different order. That's the reasoning for that. All you need to know is that going into the Elite Four, right when we cross the threshold into Lorelai's room, we are two minutes and 19 seconds ahead of Mewtwo, and that's the ultimate goal here. But the real question for me is, can Reggie Gigas make a push to get to the top three? That's pretty exciting to me. Now, as far as the, the actual gameplay goes, bare minimum, guys. I'm not going to be picking up the rare candy in Victory Road. I don't need it. No extra battles. Straight into the Elite Four. And without further ado, let's just see how it goes. We're going to start off really strong here with Lorelai, and this is pretty much the sole reason to use Thunderbolt in the Elite Four at all. You can't really pick up one-shot ranges, and right now it's really important to know, I guess, if you're thinking about Rock Slide, why don't I use it more? Fun fact, a stabbed Crush Grip does as much damage as a super effective Rock Slide. It's the same thing when you're a ground type using Earthquake, but we, let's not get into that. But the point here for this fight is level 53 allows Thunderbolt to have some pretty nice ranges, but you still can't get a a lot of one shots with the other moves so Thunderbolt's just a safer play things like Coyster have high defense Slowbro's pretty tanky so you'll just see me kind of just Thunderbolt the first few Pokemon here and then I'll swap over to Rock Slide just to save some PP going into the next fight but it's pretty clean overall you see that I tank this Hydro Pump extremely well at the end of the fight on Lapras and overall I would say this is an A plus start to the Elite Four after the fight, I do learn Ice Beam. I learn it over Rock Slide. We just talked about Rock Slide doing the same effective power as Crush Grip, even when it's super effective. So it's just, it's not needed anymore. We learn it over it, and we can just go straight into Bruno. And did I say Bruno, guys? I meant Hiker Anthony. Everybody, round of applause. Hiker Anthony is back in Kanto. He has taken over for Bruno this week. He's back. And I guess just to talk about the fight for a minute, Ice Beam does just help make the Onyxes a little bit faster. They have really high defense, so it makes them guaranteed one shots. Everything else doesn't really matter. Even if Machamp went for submission, we could tank it. We could probably tank a crit if we wanted to, but it's pretty clean, pretty quick. Uh, one shots all around, except for the Machamp. Let's keep this cruising straight into Ag. Agatha. This is another fight that you probably shouldn't overthink at all. You have a pretty high speed, you have Earthquake, just let it loose. The only thing that really happens in this fight is that you don't really have a comfortable, really high one-shot range on Golbat. And I did think Blizzard was worth picking up just for that sole purpose. So you're going to see it survive here. It gets off a of Haze. Now what Haze does is it takes away your badge boost. And we're not talking about badge boost glitch. We're talking about your actual badge boost that you're supposed to have. And I don't know if you've seen it in the video real quick, but I think we're at like 234 attack. We got hit with Haze. We went down to 208. That's because we lost the 12.5%, but it doesn't matter. Regigigas is such a solid Pokemon that hits so hard that it doesn't even matter we lost the attack. We still outspeed, we still one shot, and I guess it doesn't hurt that when you level up, you kind of just negate Haze anyway, but I digress. Agatha, pretty easy. 
Up next is Lance, and there's we got the special moves. You normally wouldn't you wouldn't want to use special moves on a 160 base attack Pokemon, but Lance, he's always the exception. He's just so weak to him. Thunderbolt for Gyarados, double weak to it. Boom, get it out of the sky. Ice Beam can just clean up the rest of the fight. Now the only thing to talk about here is Aerodactyl. This Pokemon's just so annoying to me. If you guys watch the Tyranitar part of the last video, you'll see that I got extraordinarily bad odds. I think it went something like this. I got hit with supersonic 55% I then hit myself two straight times in confusion at a 50% each chance and then I missed two straight rock slides at a 10% chance each astronomical bad luck and here you can see Aerodactyl kind of wanting to run it back but I kind of gained control it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter we take control of this fight I beam down that Dragonite and there's only one battle left Just like the rest of the run, just to keep it thematic here, we don't have to go into painstaking detail. The only thing that you need to know is that Pidgeot can survive a hit, and all it does is charge up a sky attack, but it never gets that attack off. I take it out, and then we just kind of go on a tear for a little bit. And the only really interesting thing of this fight, and I would say the one huge concession for this run, is going to be Executor. This Pokemon is a monster. Even if you have Blizzard, you cannot really get the one-shot range, so your best bet is just to double crush grip it and hope it doesn't go for hypnosis and just like a lot of things i just let jesus take the wheel here it doesn't use hypnosis we take it out and that's the worst part of the fight over with now at the end blastoise tanky and you're gonna see me make a tiny mistake here i know it can survive a hit it uses withdrawal but just me wanting to get the run over as fast as possible i use a physical move it survives and then i waste a couple of seconds by trying to select crush grip even though it's out of pp but it doesn't really matter overall i would say it costs us about 10 seconds but Blastoise goes down, and that's the run over. Reggie Gigas finishes with a time of one hour, 52 minutes and 19 seconds. And that's a really good time. How good is it? It's good enough to beat the Mewtwo bar and give us a final tier card rating of 100.76. I think I'll round that to 100.8. Now, if you want to know the math behind these tier card numbers, uh, I do have a little video in the description if you want to look at that. But this is the fifth Pokemon to ever pass the Mewtwo bar, and that's pretty significant. Now, let's bring up the tier list here. Sadly, we just missed that top three mark, but just to even be in the discussion was pretty big. It's a pretty big deal. Shadow Lugia is still hanging on, and overall, Reggie Gigas finished about 26, 27 seconds behind. I did make that tiny little mistake in the champion, but like I said, it only cost about 10 seconds, and I'm not too worried about it. So we do have a Pokemon that actually beat Slacking. It's very, very close between these two. Only about 20 seconds separates them. But it's pretty exciting to me to see a Pokemon beat Mewtwo's time. It's very rare, but I think this run was very successful. It was very fun. And that's really all I got for you guys today. Special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. The support does mean a lot. And remember, on runs like this, I do offer the patch file. I think I might have forgotten last time, but if you ever remind me, I'll just, I'll do it. Doesn't matter. But I really do appreciate the support. It means a lot to me. And if you made it this far in the video, you're a real one. And I have a conundrum. I'm going to just go on a quick tangent at the end of the video, despite me knowing that's not a good idea. I've been wanting to play Pokemon Emerald a lot. And I'm not talking about making videos. Like, believe it or not, I like to just play games. So I've been kind of like looking at Emerald a lot and I want to get good at Emerald, but I don't know. Uh, that's just something to kind of tell you guys to look forward to. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm running out of time, I feel like sometimes. I feel like I don't have enough time to make videos. So there's a chance we might be slowing down in the next few months, but I think it'll be fine. We'll still get content out. That's about it for me, guys. Small little quips and rambles at the end. It wouldn't be a gym leader map video without it, but I'll, I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.